podcast is part of the Sports Social Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to Humans of Speedway. I'm Ian Brannan and in this episode we're in conversation with one of British Speedway's rising stars who already at the age of 20 has become the under-21 British champion and a world champion. What a moment for Britain! Great Britain a world champion! Can you believe it? We all had dinner together and had the trophy there, all the medals, and it was just like, you know, what the hell? We'll hear from Tom Brennan on what it was like to be part of that squad on an incredible night which ended a 32-year wait for Great Britain to be crowned as world champions in Speedway. We'll also look back on last year and look ahead to the upcoming season in 2022 with both the Bellevue Aces and the Glasgow Tigers and much, much more besides. It's uh, There's a lot to talk about and before the end we'll also find out what Tom's dream Speedway meet would look like, including his all-time one to seven, the opposition, and uh, you know what rule he would change as well. All to come on Humans of Speedway. And without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to welcome to Humans of Speedway, Tom Brennan. Hello. I know a lot of fans will be looking forward to hearing from you because you had such an amazing season last season and, and no doubt big things yet still to come for you as well. But um, first of all, just to wish you well, because I know that you've had a very tough time personally over the last few months. And I know that all of the Speedway world have been thinking about you and, and, and all of that. So just just to uh, hope you're doing all right, that's all. Uh, thank you. I mean, as you say, I mean, it's been a... Uh been a pretty a cuff, um a, a pretty tough couple of weeks but uh no as you say i've i've, I've had some uh, great um great support from um, a lot of people um obviously especially in speedway you know i mean it's uh, all uh, all um, one big great family so no for me it's been tough but i've also been very very lucky to have the people i've had around me you know so yeah thank you sure um well, let's let's start by looking at last season, though. Um, first up, I mean, we'll get into the Speedway of Nations thing a little bit later on. So, if anybody wants to just skip to that, that'll be later. We'll we'll talk about yeah. that in in yeah. great depth in in a bit. Um, <laughs> just about your um, clubs, really, because uh, last season, of course, you started with um, Bellevue. Um, big step up for you into the Premiership. One of the the first rising stars, of course, when that system came in. Uh, and you're also with Eastbourne. Uh, which we'll talk about in a, in a moment. But first of all, for Bellevue, I mean that that I mean what a club to join. One of the great names, not just in British Speedway, but in World Speedway. One of the oldest names. Um, and with that, though, comes a little bit of pressure, I suppose, as well. But a, a supportive atmosphere, would you say? Of course, within the club that that helped you. As you look at the, your results through the season, you you know you had some great performances in the Bellevue colours. Yeah, as you say, I mean, obviously, to kind of have the call from Mark was um, unbelievable. Really, I mean, obviously, when they um, when they announced that uh, there would be the um, rising star kind of position, it was more the fact of you know less kind of hope and sort of hope hope that we can sort of get settled in there nice. And obviously, when uh, when uh, Mark called, it was almost like a big dream come true. You know, I mean, it was uh, to sort of represent um, the Aces was absolutely amazing and. Uh, I mean, couldn't couldn't come at a better time for me. Obviously, having almost almost two years out. I mean, obviously racing and then sort of being pushed into that. It was it almost was a little bit too much at the start. You know, we obviously trying to trying to make everything right and trying to be prepared as much as we can. But um, no, I mean, it was an absolutely great opportunity, and I'm I'm uh, absolutely over that I can be back again there this year. Um, as you say, I mean, it sort of struggled a little bit at the start, but uh, I think I think. As the year went on, we sort of progressively got that little bit better, even though the scores may not have shown that. You know, obviously, I um I am um, learnt learnt a lot from that. So, no, as you say, it's um great obviously to be back there again, and uh, that was a massive learning year for me, and everyone made me feel like I was home. So, obviously, that's the main thing wherever you want to be, whenever you're riding for any team. So, no, very very grateful to be. As you say that, you know, your performances did get. Um, better as the season went on, which is what the rising star thing's all about, isn't it? That's that's yeah. it's about supporting you and not putting the pressure on you. Not riding at number one, you know, you are there no. to 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 help the team out. And you know, you delivered what thirteen points, nine points in the was it the the grand final second leg? You know, you yeah, yeah. probably would say you had better success away from home than you did at the National Speedway Stadium. <laughs> yeah, I did, and you know, that's obviously always sort of something funny to say because you always sort of believe that your home track's going to be your best track, you know, and for me, unfortunately, it sort of turned to be the opposite. Um, 
Yeah, well, I'll, I'll say the opposite. I mean, we sort of had a few good home meetings, but as you say, the majority of meetings were away from home. Um, Bellevue is such a different track to what I ever knew. Um, it's such a different atmosphere. It's such a different, complete different track shape. You know, obviously I'm sort of used to the Eastbourne style, turn the bike hard and stand the bike up and get off the corner, you know, whereas here it's, you have to be relaxed. You have to kind of let the bike go. And that was a massive learning curve for me. Um, unbelievable. And I'm still learning now. I mean, obviously that's half the reason, well, the absolute main reason why obviously ended up going back there again was purely because we can continue learning. You know, that's somewhere that's, somewhere that's obviously going to improve my career um, a lot. And like we say, I mean, I hope I can continue to learn there, but it's, it, it is very, very hard to kind of get set up. But uh, once we are, I think uh, we should be okay. And you probably say that, we, you know, looking further down the line in your career, that if you can crack Bellevue, as we've seen with Dan Bewley, if you can crack Bellevue, then moving over to, to the tracks in Poland and so on should be a lot easier, shouldn't it, you'd think? <laughs> yeah, Dan, I mean, we can talk about Dan all day around Bellevue. <laughs> absolutely unbelievable last year and I think I think you can see the level that he obviously stepped um, um, stepped up to last year especially around there and as you say I mean Dan's obviously always been quite good around there but that definitely hasn't come easy to him you know he's obviously sat down and uh, definitely worked hard um, and definitely worked hard at that place and obviously people can consider can like constantly say kind of oh he, he's like I'm real fast on there because he's light and he's small and blah 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 but it's not it's obviously because he can ride the bike really well and all that sort of stuff. So, you know, to kind of see him improve massively last year. And as you say, I mean, once he got picked in, like, as in like the last like few, uh, sorry, the um, the first few meetings, he was um, almost unstoppable around there. So uh, obviously aim to be like that. But, uh, you know, I mean, I'll, I'll be doing something well if I can be in that sort of, kind of category. So, I know that we spoke to um, Sam Masters uh, on the British Speedway podcast last season when Wolves were going to go to to race against Bellevue, and he was saying that he was getting a, an engine brought over from from his Polish bike just to yeah. race at, at the National Speedway Stadium, and and it delivered because it, he had a great night that night. So yeah. it shows how much that there is that link between how you know the setup for a a Polish track and and Manchester because that's what these riders are doing, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. I mean, Ma- Ma- Manchester is probably the closest track you're going to get to to anywhere abroad in England. You know, obviously you have have uh, Peterborough, um, Sheffield, places like that. That they're obviously big and fast, but the material is very different. It's 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 quite narrow there. You know, obviously Peterborough is like a big circle, but mm-hmm. kind of Bellevue is the closest that like you will get to um, kind of abroad. You know, so for Sam to go do that obviously shows he's, uh, shows he wanted to do well and as you say I mean you put the preparation in and you kind of understand what might work well there and that's what happens you know I mean so many guys might turn up with something that they might use around Eastbourne and then they go there and it's wonder why they struggle you know but it's um mm. the main thing around there is is like trying to keep your speed up I mean that is that is the killer I mean because you could be coming in the corner and then suddenly Dan comes underneath you and completely kills your speed and then you're you know, you completely finish the rest of the race. So it's, you have to use your head there. And I mean, like, again, I mean, you kind of saw on the Speedway Nations, um, Lambert and obviously Woofy and um, Dan and stuff and how, and how they kind of knew the track, you know, they kind of knew where they were coming from. They kind of knew how to pass and they knew how to race. So for them, it's, it's great. And uh, I, I really don't believe you can get much of a better race track than Bellevue, um, in my opinion. So that's great, really. Yeah, and of course you're back there next season. You were one of the first riders to be announced for 2022 for Bellevue. Um, was it a, a straightforward decision for you that you're always going to be heading there, or was there a choice to be made between other potential suitors? Well, it's always quite a tricky one. I mean, there's always different parts to kind of go into different clubs, and obviously you have like the deal, obviously kind of like what the um what the contract is. You then obviously have how. How, uh, how will it um, improve me um, in my career? And you kind of look at the pros and cons and then you kind of look at, well, I need to be there to kind of improve what I'm doing, you know? So for me, it was a no-brainer to go back there. It was one of the, you know, it was the only sort of decision for myself. Um, I mean, we could have had options where we could have gone somewhere else, but for me, it was, um, that's the place that I felt that I was going to improve myself much, not necessarily score the most amount of points. I mean, I could I could try my heart around, um, around Bellevue, but, I probably could go to Wolverhampton, same as what we said, and kind of maybe score more points and earn myself more money. But how is how is that going to improve myself for the future? So for us, it it was a tough decision, kind of accepting that. But it was more over. It was it, it was obviously like a no brainer to kind of go back there. I mean to see. I mean 
I kind of struggled most of the way through the year around there. But as soon as we kind of got to the end of the year, like we say, I mean, the improvement for myself personally after after like the nations and and like stuff like that in myself was um, massive. So I, I want to continue that. And we obviously talk about Dan all day again, but uh, he kind of you know he's kind of an example of someone that has sort of started at Bellevue, um, similar to myself um, in his first kind of league in the top league. And I kind of would like to somewhat follow those footsteps. I mean, we're obviously we're all our own people, so it's kind of, you know, I, I want to try and do it my way. But at the same time, you can see how that works and the route he went down and the rider he is today isn't from, you know, sitting around and doing nothing. You know, he kind of pushed himself every year. So for me, that's that's kind of the route that I want to go. And Bellevue was an absolute no brainer for me. So. Well, I spoke about a year or so to a year ago to Gary Havelock, and and he was saying that I mean it's obviously a lot, way way before your time, but uh, <laughs> you know the reason that he he had the same sort of situation where he could have joined wherever, but he chose to ride at Bradford purely because Bradford was like the tracks that they had the world finals on at the time. And yeah. whilst he always did terribly at Bradford in, a, in any kind of world championship <laughs> event, uh, he, he actually won the world final at, uh, at Roslav. And obviously yeah. the, the knowledge of, of how to ride that sort of track was one of the key reasons why, you know, that happened. So, you, you know, yeah. it, it is um, sort of age old, uh, an age old formula really that, um, you know, get a, get a track, as your home track, like the ones that the big events are on, and uh, you're obviously you're going to be better at it, aren't you? Massively. I mean, in speedway, it's so so easy to kind of get stuck in this rut of being comfortable. You know, same in any job. I mean, you can obviously get kind of comfortable in one job, and you can't. You then don't really feel the need to kind of push yourself, you know, because you're comfy. You know, you can pay your bills, you can do this sort of thing. So what's the point, you know? So, but for a speed rider, for for any sort of athlete, I mean, I I don't like the class myself as an athlete. <laughs> Runners and it's unbelievable, but I sort of class myself as a as a as a motorcycle rider. So, no, for me, it's um a no brainer to keep waking up every morning and trying to push yourself. You know, obviously, we have so many training camps with um with them, all the teams. Obviously, team uh, team of GB, we actually just come back from one um literally two days ago. So, we're always trying to push ourselves, always trying to find the limit. And uh, for me, it's trying to not be comfortable. Um, as silly as that sounds, obviously, I I want to be scoring points and I want to be earning money but at the end of the day that isn't going to be, that isn't going to win me world championship so it's to just keep pushing myself uh, like you say get out get out of that little bubble that we all know and uh, and continue to move forward so yeah, and and we've seen the the pictures knocking around this week of of the uh, the training camp, and obviously they've happened uh, for a little while now. Um, yep. And these kind of things go on in the background with, with with guys like yourself who are coming through. And this is the kind of stuff that fans really don't see much, apart from the odd photo. But yep. hugely valuable, I imagine, to you both from a fitness point of view and and team building and and so much more. I mean, what what was the general sort of format of these kind of events, and, and what sort of things do you get up to? Yeah, well, it's hard, you know, because because speedways, um, how do you put it? Speedway is quite a basic form of kind of motorsport. So there isn't obviously 30 minutes plus two laps in motocross or there isn't 100 odd laps you do in like, you know, um, a motor GP. So it's, they're obviously trying to find the limits and trying to find how speedway works, you know, because speedway is such an unknown. So we obviously don't need to run the thousand meters as fast as we can and be, you know, trying to do god knows what same as these other athletes you know we need to try and be as fast as we can for 60 seconds and off for 60 seconds on for 60 seconds you know so it's really hard to try and find that thing and we're obviously really lucky that we have some great guys um training us obviously chris chris is absolutely amazing with them um, what he does and he's obviously worked with them um, with them um, a lot of guys so he's he's trying to find that kind of formula of what works right and obviously some things some things won't work um some things that he might show us probably he he like um might um might not even do again but it's kind of to try and understand how speedo works um which is the main thing i mean that's obviously with the fitness side um but we also kind of it's obviously great to kind of bond with everyone you know because there's there's like quite a lot of speedway in um, um at the minute i mean people are quite individual um which you probably noticed i mean a lot of fans have probably noticed i mean back back in the day when you know people used to go for a drink in the bar afterwards <laughs> yes is some some part of me does feel like that like we should do that you know it should be kind of part of that because people people love that you know that, that's why speedway was so big and everyone could bond with people um whereas now it seems to be quite an individual sport so for us it was really good to kind of meet everyone again and we, we i mean the majority of us have actually grown up together so it isn't it's like an unknown but 
you know, I mean, you can only probably look at, I mean, look at Peterborough last year, obviously when they won the league, um, they were on and off the track together with, with everyone. They were talking to each other. They were having a laugh. They were joking. They all wanted to win that championship, you know, and obviously same as Bellevue. I mean, Bellevue's team spirit last year was great. It was, it was really good. But you could kind of see that step difference of kind of what they did, you know. So, sure, now it's, it's uh, for us, it's just to try and make it, you know, as a, as a team, you win you win championships, you obviously win leagues. So it's, um, you know, one of those really, they're obviously trying to get us all together and, uh, and uh, be friends, which obviously is obviously pretty hard when we've got to go race each other one week and then be a team the next week. But <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty sure we're all, we're all strong enough and kind of old enough to understand when that, when that time happens. So you know, as you say, it's, uh, it's um, an absolutely massive, massive opportunity for me to be a part of, for all of us to be a part of and uh, are definitely pushing us. I mean, we had to have some, some few oxygen tanks with us, I think, because we got pushed the limit, but no, it's great. <laughs> yeah. Was that the one last year where, the, was it with the Royal Marines? Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. That was, you know, that was unbelievable. It was also one of the toughest days. Well, I would say one of, yeah, the definitely the toughest days in my life. It was really? absolutely freezing, raining, but Jordan... Jordan Palin absolutely loved it. Everyone was like, oh, I want to go on. Oh, this is awful. And Jordan Palin was oh, absolutely gone. And we were like watching him like, okay, yeah, you, you can carry on. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was unbelievable. Yeah, that was, uh, that was one of those days you definitely won't forget. <laughs> that was one of the, was that the one where the 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 Royal Marines basically offered Jordan Palin a, a, a job in the Marines if, uh, if if it didn't work out in Speedway? Yeah, I think, I'm, wasn't well, it? I don't know about that, but I imagine yeah. you would. That's what they said. They said if it, if it doesn't work out in Speedway, you should sign up for the Marines. You'll get straight yeah. in or something. Yeah, oh, he was. Yeah, I mean, it blew us all away. I know that for sure. It blew me away. But I know hardcore stuff. Yeah. Um, so looking ahead to this season, then for Bellevue first, we'll talk about Glasgow in a sec. Um, for Bellevue, you came so close, like the closest in forever, really, since yeah. to, to winning that title. Yeah. Obviously, must have been. I mean, I know. Obviously, the fans were frustrated, but not half as frustrated as the riders, I imagine, because yeah. you were so so close. I mean, <laughs> just talk us through that. <laughs> I know, probably one of the toughest things, you know. Obviously, fans and kind of supporters. Um, it's kind of hard for them to understand what what we're feeling, also, because if you see us in us us in third and fourth place, and you think, well. Oh, you know, obviously, what 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 the hell's going on? And obviously, that's the same for us. We're also thinking, what the hell's going on? You know, we're not we're not obviously settling for th- for third or fourth, but it's 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 really hard. You know, it's obviously really tough. And obviously, that that like day we obviously come with a two point advantage going into Peterborough, I believe two point mm. advantage, which wasn't much, but it was still an advantage. You know, so we had every option, we had every every chance to go win that. Um, and to be honest, we never sort of thought down on it we never thought we would be when we got there we never thought that that like this would be impossible you know we we're only thinking positive and obviously Lemo's really good at that he's he's obviously been there and done it too so for him it's it's like really cool to kind of have him in, in, in our pit and kind of explain to us different scenarios so I mean we all sort of got together but sort of, sort of what I explained before I mean you could sort of see the step difference to kind of what the Peterborough boys were doing I mean you could I mean I personally could see that um obviously coming off on and off the track and stuff like that and meeting and greeting every rider and wishing them luck. And obviously Hans Anderson was injured that night, but he he was around the pitch, you know, and obviously Brady was injured, but he was also around. So, you know, it was one of those nights where we actually tried our heart out and I know for sure I definitely did and, and every single rider did, you know, and there was a few things that went against us, but there was also a few things that went really well. And I think for one second, we shouldn't, we shouldn't feel bad. We shouldn't feel like we haven't tried our all because we definitely did. I mean, to the people that kind of think that that we pulled around at the back and take second, you know, take third and fourth, uh, they are completely wrong, unfortunately. But again, we need to try and build on that this year. And I believe the team we got, you know, should be again in that in that position and kind of squash the silver medal and go for the gold. So, yeah. So you're probably saying there that that bit of experience, you know, people sort of laughed a little bit at Peterborough with their dad's army kind of thing, but. Yeah. Maybe that experience actually did did pay yeah. off and was the difference. Yeah, I mean they definitely embraced the dad's army thing. I know that for sure. But no, it was <laughs> great to see. I mean, because they obviously built a great team from the start of the year, and everyone was taking the mick. And you know why not? I mean, but they they absolutely embraced it, and they started becoming part of their thing. You know, and everyone was going, "Oh, didn't really mean for that to happen." You know, it was meant to be a bit of a dig, but it turned out to be one of the best things for them. Um, it was the thing, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. It was their yeah. thing, and it was their kind of. 
I mean, it sounds bad, but it was their sort of like branding, you know, they were like, yeah. oh, Dad's Army, come watch, you know, and it was like, really, it was, it was quite cool. People get behind that, you know, that's the kind of, that's how most sports work, you know, it's kind of, you need to get behind someone, you may sort of see a certain rider you like, because they might, I don't know, do, do, do something really cool, you know, so for them, that was really, that was really cool, but um, yeah, I mean, the experience they had, obviously, Bomber, Scott, Hans Anderson, you know, Bjarne Pedersen, it was just unbelievable. Like the, the people they had in their side um, wasn't necessarily, I mean, they're obviously probably not all at the peak of their career. They've probably gone sort of past it, but they still kind of, you know, they, they, they still perform and they can still get behind each other and, and sort of get themselves back to their peak, you know, with each other. So that was actually really cool to see. And as much as I wanted to beat them with every bit in my heart, it was also quite cool to see that they were all together, you know, and, and you could sort of see midway through the meeting, we started to panic and they didn't, you know, they were, they were calm as anything and they were laughing and that's kind of how they win championships. So for us, I hope, I hope we can take that on board and kind of embrace them a little bit, you know, as, 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 as bad as that sounds. Um, I think for, for us, we need to definitely try and try and do somewhat similar to that. Well, any team does as such. Sorry. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you will have more experience next year and perhaps when you get to those parts of the season where, you know, like this this last season where you went wrong, hopefully you got that benefit of experience yeah. and you don't make the same mistakes again, I suppose. Um, looking ahead to 2022, um, a slightly different look to the Bellevue Aces because you've had a few team changes, but some uh, of you uh, remain the same as well. And uh, you are one of the, one of the old hands who's uh, going to be remaining. Um, Max Frick, of course, joins the side, which has, has got to be a big boost. Yeah. And uh, uh, you know, Charles Wright remains in the side as well. But back to Norick. I mean, he's—I yeah. saw him at Redcar, and he's—he's uh, he's an exciting talent. I think um, probably needs a little bit more time to, to to really, you know, probably get up to speed. But I think the fans are going to like him. I think you know, if, if you stick with him and got a lot of talent. And he said in the Speedway Star that he'd chatted to you. Um, at the Peter Craven, I think last year, and and you know you were talking about Bellevue, and uh, I think he spoke to Charles Wright as well. So yeah, it certainly had a feel for the place before signing up, didn't yeah, it? Yeah. So we, uh, that's funny, obviously with um, with um, Nick. I mean, we we kind of met each other around about 20, 2020 for like a European semi final, and uh, you sort of see him ride, and I had no idea, but he's, he's only, he was only sixteen at the time, maybe, and he's only seventeen. Is he eight, seventeen or eighteen? Uh, now? Seventeen now, I think. Yeah, seventeen. That's what I mean, and and. The way he rides the bike is uh, is a uh, exceptional for kind of his age, you know, and kind of his um his his like experience. And I mean, we obviously get on really well, but for him to, for him to come to Bellevue was uh, I didn't I obviously didn't really expect it um come last year. But yeah, he was uh, he was really good last year. I mean, he he was obviously in Poland. I think he raced for Lancia, I believe. Yes, um, yeah, he's got he's got quite a long contract there. I think hasn't he? He's... Yeah. Yeah, and he he actually went really well, and I think I think for Bellevue that's an absolutely amazing signing because it's someone that they can improve on. You know, it isn't isn't going to be someone that's at the end of their career. You know, and he's right at the start, and that's someone that Bellevue can work with him. They can kind of show him a lot of things, and obviously that's the main thing. That's that's that that's how he will learn. Um, but I also believe he's going to show us how to learn. So. <laughs> well, as well, you, you know, know e Egon Muller is one of his um, one of his uh, mentors too. So maybe he'll be doing a bit of singing as well uh, afterwards. You, you can never tell. But yeah. he's got some good people around him. Egon, uh, Robbie Kessler, and he's got a lot of experience in yeah. Europe. So as you say, you know, he might might bring you some tricks as well. Yeah, exactly. It was yeah, I, yeah. I think that's going to be really good for him. It's also going to be really good for us. We're gonna. You know, it's it's gonna it's gonna be exciting next year, um, and I think that's what people have to keep. You know, because people can get very comfortable. Same as us, you know, people can get very comfortable in like the riders they like, and they don't really like to take chances on on like, other guys. So, for us, it's great. It's great to have a, a fresh team. You know, to kind of embrace embrace what we, what we didn't quite do last year, and obviously try and make it happen this year. So it'll be it'll be very exciting, and I'm sure he'll definitely turn a few eyes th this year. Yeah, if I'm honest, I'm quite surprised he's gone straight in at the Premiership. Um, I, I, yeah. Myself, I would have thought that maybe the Championship would have been the sort of next step. But, um, you know, we've seen, though, uh, like yourself, like Jordan Palin, like all the other rising stars, that you, you can be thrown in at the deep end and maybe that's sometimes the yeah. best the best way to learn, you know? It's funny, I actually feel, I actually feel like, like an oldie now. I'm like, I'm like, 
I'm like walking around the pits and I'm like, oh yeah, I'm st- I still I still feel quite young. And then there's Jordan Sad stood next to me, who's like 17, 18, and he got his Norik coming over his head, and I'm like, I'm 20 years old. You've been you have gonna have to have my you know. <laughs> <laughs> but it's pretty cool to see yeah it's that's that's life though that's life yeah. i don't i don't i don't feel any older than like when i when i was like 18 or 19 and you know i'm 43 now and yeah, yeah. it just it's hard to get your head around um with glasgow you, you ended up at glasgow as a result yeah. of unfortunate circumstances at eastbourne which yeah. for you personally that that is your club isn't it and obviously you're you've got great family links to the club yeah. as well and it's it's the place you've grown up at so for you it must have been harder to take than f- for most of the other riders I, I would have thought because you know there's that personal connection with that club as well not just not just a sort of a financial yeah. one <laughs> and yeah so with Eastbourne I mean we could talk about this all day because there's so many different stories and so many different things and blah 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 but it sort of come down to obviously they obviously kind of got into um, a little bit of trouble which was unfortunate which is terrible to see um I obviously grew up with obviously Martin Dugard and seeing seeing Bob and seeing sort of the empire that they obviously built and uh, obviously Connor and all of the others, you know, that, that they obviously built and got it to the state that Eastbourne Speedway was. I mean, they're almost like an empire, you know. They're obviously, the Dugard family was so involved in Eastbourne and to see how much kind of effort they put into it. And then for the one year that they're not there, it just turned around and flipped, you know, and it was like as if they, <laughs> it was almost as if like, that club needed them to run it you know so it was a shame i mean obviously there's like there's like a lot of stories which would be pointless getting into but it's um it's a shame it's it's a real big shame obviously like i say i was there since i was absolutely tiny and i can i can remember so th- there's a lot of great memories there and i really do hope they can get back um maybe not with the same management from my point of view but you know whatever brings them i really hope i can see once we go back again yeah i think everybody hopes that it's that that is the case and you know that i know that there's a bit of time being taken out at the moment to think about things and licenses are on hold and all that kind of stuff but while ever that's the case there's there's hope and i think of all the tracks that are currently not got speedway at them that you'd think eastbourne surely is one that is going to get itself yeah. going again at, yeah, at some point i mean they're like obviously you're oxford but they're the only kind of track down south now you know obviously rye house went um lakeside went so those were two big tracks that went, and obviously now to see Eastbourne go, I mean, I never thought I'd see the day when Eastbourne go, because you'd always kind of joke with Bob back in the day, and he would be like, yeah, well, you know, this is the last year of Eastbourne, and blah, but you knew it wouldn't be, you know, you knew he couldn't let go of that, and obviously Martin wanted to continue that, so did Connor, and obviously things kind of changed, and then Martin then kind of ran the stadium, um, and then obviously other people come in to kind of run the speedway, but um, as you say, I mean, the track at Eastbourne's great. It's different. Um, the facility at Eastbourne are absolutely fine. Yeah, they're not the newest, but it's still Eastbourne. You know, there's obviously, there's obviously like a lot of history there. So, for me, for a lot of people, for a lot of fans, for a lot of supporters, they want to go still support Speedway, but they also wouldn't want to travel two hours to Oxford, you know, so or how far it is. So, you know, they want to go to you know, sort of support the club they have done from for a long time, and I obviously hope I can see that soon. Yeah, absolutely. So, and and. Um... We'll get into the the backstory a little bit because you, you mentioned um, Martin. Obviously, Martin's your for people who don't know is your your, your stepdad, and yeah. so you've you, that's kind of obviously a, a, a massive influence, a, a British Speedway legend of of his <laughs> era. He was in the the Great Britain team and all that, and and all these big things which you won't remember, but I do. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and uh, you know he, you know he was there around the same time as Kelvin and and Gary Havelock and riders of of that sort of era in in the in the great british setup and of course um synonymous with with Eastbourne and and, yeah. and plenty of other clubs that but having that having him as a an influence obviously it's no surprise that you found yourself into speedway <laughs> because yeah. you know with yeah. with that in mind and and no surprise i think that people will that, that you are you know even in your riding style and how you and how you're racing you know there's there's definitely influence there and and um yeah, I mean, just tell yeah. us about that, growing up in that well, kind of... It's quite a funny story, really, and uh, not actually many people know this, right? So we kind of, we were racing Speedway, we, we, we all start, st- um, um, started with the grass track, um, we obviously progressed through that, and then you got to the point where oh, we can give the Speedway a try, and obviously it was only really me, my mum, and my brother, uh, Ben. So he he obviously 
kind of took me to races. My mum took me everywhere. Uh, we went. We decided we were going to the British Championships at uh, uh, Eastbourne, uh, and we, we turned up and we had terrible bike problems. And I mean, it was like it, we couldn't get off the line. We couldn't get the bike to start, and we had no clue. You know, we kind of obviously Ben did, but it was we just didn't really know how to fix it. So next, thing you know, we kind of see this uh, this a guy on a um, on a, a tractor, kind of like uh, doing the uh, doing the track at Eastbourne, and we're like. You know, he, he, he kind of jumped over the fence and gave us a hand. And we're like, oh, this is real nice of him. And obviously, me and my mum had no idea who, who this guy was. And he ended up fixing the bike, ended up kind of taking the bike back to his house for us, you know, free of charge. I mean, he just he just kind of did it and wanted to help us. And mum was trying to give him, like, 20 quid to this, like, to this like track man. It turns out it was <laughs> it was Martin Dugard. So this this track man, that obviously, had, like, gone out of his way to help us. Um it was that, that that was the first time we ever met Martin. Um, I still had no idea who Martin was. You know, we were kind of like, oh, is, is he is he still the um the untrack guy at Eastbourne? But you know, that's that's always like a standing joke with obviously everyone. And um, no, I mean he he's he's been massively um um uh, influenced to me. And obviously from the age I can remember being ten years old, he was the one stood on the centre green and showing me how to turn the bike and wanted to see me hit the, hit this certain cone in a certain way. And you know. That was absolutely great, but he also kind of taught me that, you know, that you can't get comfortable. I mean, he he was one of the first people to say that he 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 kind of wishes that he hadn't have been so kind of comfortable. And he obviously would say with Eastbourne, the majority of a career. I mean, I know he moved away to Oxford for a little bit, but he was comfortable, and he just kind of kept pushing that on me. You know, I mean, you obviously want to get out of Eastbourne, you kind of want to be in that kind of be be out of your comfort zone, you know. So for him, he obviously taught me. I would say the most growing up um, in our speedway. Obviously, then had my brother help me massively. Obviously, he he I used to ride. Um, but yeah, Martin was a massive influence, and uh, he kind of took me over growing up. Um, and you know, and then we got on the two hundred and fifty, and it all sort of clicked. You know, when we decided we could make something of this. Um, so yeah, no, that's how we met Martin, and he's been a great influence to me, and he still is. You know, he's uh, sort of slowed down a little bit. He's sort of doing the whole like house life now, but you know, he's great obviously loving it so uh really really can't complain on that so that's a wonderful story though and uh yeah. just how you know speedway connected you all together in in that way yeah. as well and yeah. and but obviously it's, but i think that's good though that you've you know his experience there saying that you shouldn't you know he's you're you're getting the benefit there of a career of another rider who's who's yeah. been there seen it and and as and can sort of speak to you from the future in in some respects and yeah you know, a big benefit to you to be going now to these places that maybe without that you you wouldn't be thinking no, that way. Exactly, and like I I used to when I was in my younger days, which was a while ago now, but back <laughs> to, uh, you know 2016 when I was just starting on the 500 and we just started racing national league. Um, I would probably sleep until you know a standard a standard teenager, you know, st- sleep until like 10 or 11 o'clock. You know, nothing nothing's bothering me. I have nothing to worry about. It might wake me up at eight o'clock in the morning or seven o'clock in the morning with like a ringtone next to my ear and saying get up and I'm like what are you talking no well, I've got, I, well you have um you have um dirty bikes to wash and I'm like well yeah I've got all day and he's like well what if someone calls you to ask you to ride oh yeah so he would get me out if I had bike to wash he'd get me up and that was I absolutely hated him for it I absolutely hated for him like for the first couple of years and then I was like looking at now when I'm a bit older it's like that obviously that's what's now pushed me to kind of get up and do my bikes and kind of have the work ethic. Um, sorry, the uh, the work ethic that I do because I could have taken the route as many kind of guys do of the easy life and kind of whatever suits suits me at the time. But I've learned quite quite quick that you know you need to go chase what you want and uh, that's kind of where it started really with Martin waking me up and annoying me with a frying pan smacking that or something. So, yeah. <laughs> oh, wow, <laughs> that's a rude awakening. <laughs> Fantastic, fantastic, uh, um, and y- you're. I mean, one of the sort of common themes because this last few episodes I've done of this podcast, we've spoken to riders yeah. of a similar cropper, if you like, uh, there's yourself, yeah. um, Jordan Jenkins and Jordan Palin. I'd run out yeah. of Jordans to interview, so uh, yeah. that's why we come to you. Um, but um, uh, one thing they have in common is is the you know the, the family support 
um, yep. for, for Speedway, which to do everything, you know, your, your marketing, help you with that, cleaning bikes, getting your places, yep. all these things that just never stop. Um, and for you, it goes even deeper in a way because your your girlfriend, Kristen, is the daughter of Craig Cummings. Now, Craig Cummings was the sort of legendary mechanic of the era for Billy Hamill when he was world champion, 1996, ruling the world. And his son, Kyle, is your main go-to mechanic. But you've got all this support because Kristen looks after you at your social stuff as well. You've got, you know... Um, the Cummings family looking after your bikes and what a fantastic position for you to to have found yourself yeah. in oh yeah wow well, i don't even know where to start with that one i mean there's there's so many people that have helped me to get to where i am now and that will continue to help me to get better and better and i mean obviously martin would help me um but i was also quite an individual person you know i kind of turned to some practice days and, and obviously help 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 like myself i would obviously try and find ways that that I could get to every practice day when I was 15, 16 and sort of jump in with vans of people if Martin couldn't go or which the majority of the time Martin wouldn't go um, purely because he was probably working um, in something. But I obviously wanted to try and try and continue, you know, so I would jump in the van with, um, you, you probably know, um, Nathan Ablett um, and his dad. They would, they would, I would just be like, oh, can you come pick me up or can I meet you here? And they would yeah, jump in and, you know, we'd go. And that was the first sort of step of when I kind of met, met some people through, through uh, Speedway, but they're obviously like um, like a family to me now. I mean, they've obviously helped me massively, and without them, I wouldn't add half the practice days and half the amount of support. So I'm obviously grateful for them. But at the same time, it's such a family oriented uh, orientated sport. I mean, my mum, uh, she was she was my biggest fan, and she always will be, um, um, and she always will be my uh, biggest fan. You know, she was the one who who sort of slaved all the driving and did everything she paid for everything you know obviously when I was really young and she's the one who pushed me there you know and she never gave up on me even if the even when it kind of looked like I wasn't going to do too good you know she was like you know we can keep going and, and stuff like that and she'll always be here and I know she'll always be here so for me that's obviously great and I want to continue what she started too um which is one of the main things for me in my life now um same as everything you know obviously same as my brother I mean he's the same we kind of want to do things for her now um in a, within respect, I mean, not obviously live live her life, but we also want to make her proud. So for me, that's obviously a massive thing. She's obviously always been there, and uh, and then we sort of sort of stumbled across um across Kristen. I mean, Kristen was completely out out of, out of the blue. I mean, we obviously didn't d- didn't plan to meet each other. We never met each other. We just I was just we we just met, you know. And it was one of those things that, that obviously clicked straight away. And we uh we've we've obviously grown together as people. I mean, we obviously met quite young. I mean, I was 17 and she was 16. So I mean, obviously 20 now and she's, she's just turned 19. So for us, we've, we've built in one of the most important parts of our life. We've obviously built together, you know, so she's been an absolute rock to me for, for so many years now. And it's, it's quite funny because prior to meeting her, I never thought I would, I never thought that I'd settle down. I wouldn't like the idea, but she's absolutely, you know, she's, she's like changed my life and, She's now massively involved with Speedway. I mean, people don't see it. All of my social media, all of my websites, um, any posts that is just do a Tom Renner racing, all my suit, uh, all the sponsorship logos, all that sort of stuff. She deals, and, and I said, them as my accounts. I mean, her and uh, Kerry, her mum, have absolutely changed that for me. I mean, they've 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 been the people that have changed Speedway from being a hobby to Speedway being a professional career. You know, that's the difference. So, uh, Craig. Kyle, who doesn't get enough mention too. Kyle is uh, obviously Craig's son, Kristen's brother. He's he helped me last year um, when not a lot of people would. I mean, well, maybe not like even in 2020 when there was no hardly any meetings. Um, I couldn't really afford to pay him. I mean, like, truthfully, I mean, he would just come do it for the love of it, and he obviously wanted to help me and and, and learn at the same time. Um, so obviously, Craig, he has he's probably one of the best guys to sort of teach him. Obviously, in Craig. Um, so no, for him it's great, and obviously he's now back on board next year helping me, which is well this year even sorry, which is unbelievable. I mean he's a he's he's, he's just qualified for um, motorcycle engineer. He just, just just did a four year uni course. So for him, Speedway Speedway's a starting point, and I'm really glad that I can kind of help him get to a certain point before he can then go and get a proper job. So <laughs> or he can go uh, or he can go and explore the world to what to what I believe he is more than capable of. Um, so Kerry's been massive. Um, I can talk about us all day. I really hope you've got another couple of hours. But... As long as you need, as long as you need. Credit all the, all the people you need. All the people, uh, <laughs> I mean, I can. I mean, people know who helped me, and obviously, 
everyone knows this obviously here for me um knows I'm very grateful for their help and obviously my brother Ben and it's just it's just such a family orientated sport um that that we wouldn't be here um a lot of us guys well everyone um involved in speedway probably at some point would need their family i mean everyone does um to kind of get them through life and i'm at the point now where i want to try give back what they've given me um as much as i can and i'm very very grateful to be able to sit here um in this house and kind of have the bikes next to me and be able to live my dream um that's one of the main things that i'll always be grateful for and i continue to to try and make as everyone as proud as I can. Um, that's the, that's obviously always the goal in life. So for me, no, thank you to everyone. It's obviously, especially family. I mean, that's that's the main one. But yeah, I think you've got to listen to the universe sometimes as well. And yeah. and whilst it's not always, uh, you know, life isn't always great. But you you know you, these people that you meet along the way, as as you've done, you know, there's there's something there telling you that you know you've been introduced to some great people who are helping you go yeah. in this right direction and and yeah you know you've got the talent to to, to fulfill it and, and the support around you so that's that's got to be uh, you know great structure even though it's all sort of happened by by chance in a way but yeah. that's life isn't it that's how yeah. it goes you have to take it with both hands and people people don't have to help me um a lot of people don't don't expect anything in return i mean obviously craig and kerry and chris and everyone like that i mean kyle like everyone my my brother no one expects anything in return for me you know they don't they don't expect me to say i said i said they're helping me or say that they want you know they want any credit you know that they're, they're doing it because they want to help me and want to help me in my career and they i sort of hope they like me so you know they're obviously trying to me. So, no it's great and like i say I, I will forever be grateful for everyone that's helped me um and like you say we have to take, take it with both hands and continue what we got and uh and and just make it better yeah, keep on keeping on, and we know you'll do that. And of course, your championship team that you, that you ended last season with to get back to uh, get back to, to to your sides that you were racing with, um, Glasgow Tigers in the championship, pretty much just like Bellevue, came so close to winning a title, uh, and you were in both grand finals last year, and both times a runner up unfortunately so that's looking something you're looking to to sort out i'm sure and the glasgow tigers taking matters into their own hands by um well sorting themselves out with uh, a couple of riders from the pool team that was victorious not only in in the league but also in the cup of course as well in the championship so that that's one way to get one up on your rivals isn't it why not i mean we can take apart their team that won last year and put it into ours so no i mean i mean pick it for senna um Cammy Brown, everyone at, at like Glasgow understand how to make a good team, and 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 they are there to win. You know, they're not there to mess around. They're not here to come second. They're here to come third. They're here, they're here to win purely. And as you've seen in the past, they are they are pretty ruthless. You know, if you aren't performing, you will be out, and that's the way it works. We all understand that. We all we all get that because they're not trying to. They aren't they are they aren't trying to fill the numbers this year. You know, they're obviously trying to go win. Um, and that's why I'm a part of it. You know, because I believe they. They like want to build a real strong future, um, and I want to build a real strong future. So with us two together, we can work our way up the ladder, and hopefully I can bring them some um, um, some success, and they will also bring me some success. You know, so um, as you say, I mean, um, Ostergar, Cookie, um, they're just two names that um, have a lot of experience. You know, unbelievable experience um, that will always help. Um, which is the main thing I think. Obviously, that's why. That's what they wanted in the team with some experience. And then they've also got some unexperienced guys. I mean, like Connor Bailey, um, Ben Basso. I, I'm really not too sure on Ben Basso. Obviously, I um, sort of saw him a few times last year. I've never spoken a word to him. So I hope he can speak English because, you know, I can't speak Danish. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, And then, no, but he looks absolutely great. And he obviously won, won a fair amount of races last year. And I just saw this big green light in front of me sometimes. And I was wondering what the hell was that? And it was it was actually Ben Basso. So, you know, he's been great last year and hopefully he can continue his form onto what he's done um onto last year you know and he he was almost like mr entertainer last year for paul you know was every time you saw him the crowd loved him he had his pirate hats and he was he was the first to go see the people and that's also part of glasgow you know they they're like trying to build a future for them and trying to make speedway great again and i think people like that um we could also talk about danny Ayres too i mean obviously he was he was one of the great showmen um, in uh, in a speedway, in my opinion, and they need people more like that. You know, obviously it's pretty hard to, I mean, to be that confident, but people are born with that, and let's hope that he can bring some spark to Glasgow, which I'm sure he will. Um, 
obviously Connor Bailey has been obviously rode with him last year. He he was he was really good, you know, and obviously it's hard for him because his whole family had to move from Australia and he's now kind of had to change his whole life around and live here, you know, and real chase the dream and, and like for all the Australian guys, for all the American guys too, it's just um obviously Brock's in the team too. I mean, he was obviously real cool to me last year and it was the first year I really got to know him, you know, so for him, it's great, great. He's back, and but you know, all of these guys have to have to change their life. You know, obviously for me, it's what four hours up the road now, um, but for them, it's halfway across the world. You know, so it's obviously pretty tough. But they they are uh, they are pretty strong guys, and obviously Glasgow have have built a very strong team, um, and hopefully we can have like I think we're going for a um, like a training kind of camp with all of them. So that'd be quite funny to to see me on the floor. They'll have to get me a few inhalers. Um, they'll probably laugh at me a few times, but no, it'll be it'll be it'll be great to kind of see everyone and build that team spirit and crack on with the year because I'm sure it's a big year ahead of us. I'm sure it is, and the new competitions, of course, in the championship as well. The the summer tournament is going to be something different with a big yep. grand final at Sheffield at the end of it, uh, and a new track as well, Oxford. And you mentioned you've got family link there with uh, Martin used to uh, yep. ride uh, ride at Oxford once upon a time. It would be, be good to to go and see the old place again, I imagine. Yeah, yeah. Well, I've I've never never been there. Never, never. I've kind of watched a few meetings there on on YouTube as such, but. Yeah, Martin. Martin's a very close book about Speedway nowadays. He doesn't really kind of mention a whole lot about his career. That's the sort of person he was. And people that remember Martin, he was very straight. Yeah, down to the point. Let's let's get home as fast as we can and make you know do what we got to do and sort of win races. You know that was his style. And some people loved that, and some people absolutely hated it. And but that's fine. You know, he really really couldn't couldn't care. So for him to kind of explain his career to me, he hasn't really opened up too much about that. Um, he obviously mentions good moments and bad moments, but. For Oxford, he always said how good it was, um, and kind of he hasn't really made much of a thing. But we always kind of said, "Oh, you always sort of see the pages on Facebook um, say like, Oxford Speedway," and it was like, "Is this really ever going to happen? You know, what's going on?" And it happened, and it's great to see because there's such a big community there still, you know. So for me, that's obviously one of the biggest things that Speedways. Yeah, we've lost a few tracks, but we've also we've we've gained a few tracks, you know. So hopefully, we can keep keep going ever so slightly and uh, continue to make that progression and. Oxford looks a great track and they've obviously trying to build a great team too so for me it's all go um, as long as Glasgow are, uh, are ahead of them in the points it doesn't make a difference to me so <laughs> Touche uh, We're going to have a quick break and then next on Humans of Speedway getting on to that big subject of the Speedway of Nations that gold medal win for Team Great Britain ending a 32 year wait to be crowned as world champions and Tom Brennan certainly played his part in that squad. We'll find out more about that fantastic day in October 2021 in just a couple of moments here on Humans of Speedway. You're listening to Humans of Speedway. I'm Ian Brannan. If you haven't already, make sure you hit the like, follow or subscribe button on whichever app you're using. It basically just puts you in the VIP lane and makes sure that when any new episodes are released, you get into your device straight away. No need to refresh. Uh, that's got to be a good thing. So uh, if you can do that, that'll uh, save you a job next time. Uh, my guest in this episode is Tom Brennan, part of Team Great Britain, the gold medalists at the Speedway of Nations in 2021, ending a 32-year wait for Great Britain to uh, become world champions. And what a night it was. We're going to talk quite a bit about this right now, Tom. Um, but that wasn't your only success in 2021 because you were also the um, British under-21 champion as well. You are positively tripping up over gold medals, Tom. That one. Oh, that's the one. Look at that. There it is. <laughs> that's the one of them. It's kept very safely on my shelf. <laughs> I, I bet. At this point, Tom is displaying his Speedway of Nations gold medal. It says FIM World Champion on it. <laughs> so uh, it's official. Um, Tom, uh, tell us about this this whole process because Team Great Britain, a lot of work has gone in over a number of years now all at delivering success. And we knew it was a matter of time. Um, and it it happened on that day in October in 2021 uh, you were part of that team. Um, tell us about 
some of the process towards building towards that success with with Ollie Allen and Simon Stead, of course, but there's, there's so many other people involved in, in yeah. the GB setup as well. Um, but also about that particular event, because the Speedway of Nations, you have this halfway point. What were the conversations that you were having as a team back at the hotel after the first night, knowing that you know, you'd done all right, but Ty Wolfenden was injured, you're going to have to have a different yeah. team lineup for the second and decisive day and you kept your cool. Yeah, so I mean first off, I mean Team G B that's obviously what they what they work towards, you know, they obviously work towards being to be a nation's champion. So to start off that was obviously a massive, massive dream come true for them and that's what they're doing all of us, you know, they're obviously training on all of us under twenty ones, under twenty threes, you know, all of the squad are trying to be that champion. So for them it was like it all sort of come at once, you know, it was almost like a bit of a well, okay, you know, like we've done it, and it was the, it was one of the greatest feelings ever. You know, obviously when they ran into centre green, and they worked very hard for that. I mean, you can't you can't like deny that everyone worked hard. You know, everyone a part of that team there. Not not only on that night, but for the last three years that have changed Team GB around. Um, so for me, it was great to be a part of that. Um, first off, I mean, even to be asked to do the thing, I'd have to double check with them. That, are they sure they want me to do it? So you know, for them it was great, and obviously took it with both hands, and that was. One of those things that you obviously look through throughout the year and want to try get the spot, but it's also one of those things that's completely out of your control. So you just do as best as you can, and luckily I ended up getting the pick, and I was I was really grateful for that, and I just wanted to prove that I was obviously the right choice. So yeah, after the first night, after we were, I can't remember what the points were, but I know that you know we were in a good position. It was like you know let's let's try and resettle. Obviously, Wolfie had a big crash, um, which was really scary. That was one of the one of those things where the stadium goes silent, and it was like, whoa, okay, is he all right? In typical Wolfie style, he gets up and walks away, and no problem. So it was, uh, yeah, it was scary, but you know, for us that was uh, that was great because we one of the main things in speedway or in any sport you have to prepare to achieve right so you have to kind of prepare you have to put time in you have to understand what could go wrong before the event and they had that ready you know they had they had um uh, dan beauty had a suit they obviously he had him ready had covers made they didn't have his you know had his bikes there so it was a no-brainer you know obviously because if he couldn't ride it was like dan's in you know and, and dan was ready he was ready for it from day one you know he was obviously stood watching the first meeting with us so for him it was a big kind of shock to the system to we're actually going to go racing and he he obviously kept his calm and did his did his country proud so that was really cool but we had like a big deep like a they, they, they called it like a debrief like kind of like a meeting after the after the first round and we were all calm you know there was no there was no nerves there was no kind of thought of what could go wrong what could go right it was just let's go do it and what we what come away with is like what we come away with and there was a lot of there was a lot of discussion prior and obviously being in like the home team like the, like the home nation and being at Bellevue and all this sort of stuff you know the home crowd and stuff that brings that extra bit of pressure but if you watch Lambert and Dan they they like kept their calm and obviously for, for myself it was tough because you kind of just got thrown in at a random point in the meeting that I was racing, obviously, to Philip, who did an amazing job for Sweden. I mean, he was a standout performer for sure. I mean, across the whole thing, he was he was a bit of a nutcase at times, but he's also was was real good at others. So, you know, that's that was really cool to see, and obviously the fans loved him, and he embraced that massively. So that was really cool. But um, he, I obviously got thrown in in like a race with him, and it was like, hold on, he's been racing all day. He's got the setup. He, the setup isn't everything. It's probably ninety nine point nine percent yourself. So you know, we have to just hop on and believe in yourself and. That's what I did myself personally. Obviously, believed in like what I had. Had I believed in the people around me, and I knew how to ride the track. So it was more the fact of let's just try and keep him behind me. And and obviously that that's what happened. And Ty kind of rode me home the first time, and then didn't quite go to plan the second time when Philip outgated both. Well, sort of coming underneath me and Lambert at the first corner, and we had to kind of stay calm. And that's what we did. You know, we both we both just were yeah we can get past it and that was fine we come in and that was and that was for me job done you know that's obviously what I was there for and I feel like I've kind of fulfilled what they wanted um so for me it was a fantastic feeling and yeah I could talk about it all day really but yeah to be honest that was uh that was something that that will be in my memory for a long, long time yeah it was an incredible um incredible weekend really but then of course it all came down to that big moment and tell us about the winning moment you weren't racing in the final heat um but you, you'd certainly done your job across the course of the weekend and you were stood with simon stead and ollie allen and and the rest of the the gb guys who were uh, in that area at that moment watching this final race and you know it's dan Bewley and robert lambert matt sayanovsky and 
Bartosz Schmarschlik. And, you know, nobody would have nobody would have imagined what was about to unfold, would they? No, exactly. And and that's like sometimes you need sometimes you need to take a little bit of luck and we did have a bit of luck, you know, we had a bit of luck with obviously Yanovsky crashing, but at the same time, was that a bit of luck? You know, did did were they nervous before the before the race? Did they kind of not speak about it before? Were they just going for the win? And obviously I know Smiles that come underneath Yanovsky and did that put them off? Did they you know, you know what I mean? So there's like luck to it, but there's also preparation to it. Who will be world champions? Will it be Poland? Will it be Great Britain? So obviously I know we were third and fourth at the time, um, but that's sometimes all you need is a little bit of pressure and show show front wheel. And obviously Janowski ended up ended up um, crashing, which was unfortunate for Poland. I mean, it was pretty unfo- um, unfortunate. And now Smarsi goes on. Janowski's coming off. Janowski's off. Great Britain are going to be world champions. Great Britain are going to be world champions. As soon as that happened, I remember I never forget looking look, looking around and. Um, Ollie and Simon were just like like a picture. They were like, they, they didn't know what to say. They were literally completely stunned. Like they were like, we've won. That's the Inoski job. But Great Britain are going to be crowned champions of the world. Wow, look at this as Lambert goes wide, smashing up the inside. But now Great Britain are two laps away from being world champions. And they were just saying, hold on, Dan, just stay on, just stay on. And then Lambert was passing in um, Smarslick. And they're like, oh, no, don't pass him. Like, they were shouting and stuff. And it was really fun. It was like one of those moments that, like, it all sort of comes out at once. All of that all of that emotion from Ollie and Simon and from us, it was just, oh, what do we do now? And we won. And that will forever, that will forever be a massive moment in, in, in all of their lives. What a moment for Britain! Great Britain are world champions! Can you believe it? I've been saying all weekend long. It doesn't matter what happens in the 42 here. It's all about what happens in a one-minute moment of a grand final. Janowski lost control, lost the motorbike, and Great Britain avoid that last place. And Great Britain are world champions in the Monster Energy, FIM, Speedway of Nations. We all saw the celebrations, and it was tremendous scenes at the National Speedway Stadium with both the fans and and the riders. And, you know, it was a great occasion, of course it was. But what were the celebrations like among the GB team afterwards then? I imagine your your team debrief was a little different after the second night than it was the first night. It was really cool. I mean, we all, we all like, sat in. Uh, we all had dinner together and had the trophy there, all the medals, and it was just like, you know, what the hell? What's going on here? You know, how is this? The, the last night we were just no no problem you know so for us it was it was it was it was amazing we all kind of stood up and said said a few words and then they all sort of disappeared to to somewhere I probably can't say um in there <laughs> to some bar probably uh, but no they were they absolutely loved it and you know for us it was it was a great feeling for me to be able to share that with Kristen and obviously Kyle and Craig and stuff and obviously my mum was at home so she was watching that and that was that was unbelievable same with my brother so you know, I'm so glad she got to see that, and at the same time, to share that with Kristen and to for her to for us to share that moment together was was amazing, and I hope we can continue to share those moments together. So, yeah, and also, of course, last year you became the British Under 21 champion as well, um, which was, I mean, it was between you and Drew Kemp, wasn't it? I think I don't think either of you had missed a beat all night until that heat where you actually had to face each other, and and one of you had to uh, one of you had to come second, and. Uh, yeah, that was a great night for you. Yeah, that was that was an unbelievable night for me. And very rarely do you get a night where you don't have any problems. You don't think about what bad could happen. You don't have any doubt. You know, that was one of those nights where it was confident and we showed up and I knew I had a job to do and no pressure. You know, just go and go and do it. Obviously, I felt a bit of pressure from from other people, but in myself, um, obviously, I'm I'm normally the person that puts the most pressure on myself. So for me, I was calm and when I did the job, you know, I had some great people there. Obviously. I, I keep mentioning the same names, but obviously Kyle, Craig, Kristen, Kerry, my mum, everyone. So they obviously are all there. And again, to share that moment and to put all that work in, you know, because start of the year, we were we were like wondering how the year is going to plan out, you know. So for us to, to achieve that, and that's something that was a lifelong sort of dream. Um, but at the same time, it's, it sort of felt right, you know, it felt like that 
it felt like we earned that, you know. So for me, it was great, and I want to, you know, hopefully we can uh, we can continue that on. But I've done it now, and I'm I'm obviously really happy that I can put that in my belt. One thing to look back on, though, that because firstly we had the 2020 where nothing happened, um, and you were flying in your career, you know, 2017, 2018, you were um, champions of, of various different levels and um, under 19, you came second, I think, didn't you, in the under 19s? Is that right? Yeah. Um, yeah but then fine. you had this humongous crash where you, you broke your leg really yeah. badly and it was a, you know, a terrible incident. And I think that was against Glasgow, wasn't it, for Eastbourne? And um, yeah, so... I'm just thinking that at that age, you know, you you were what seventeen, eighteen, having such a horrendous crash, which what well, a long recovery time, and you know, a very involved yeah. situation in hospital as well. I know. Um, yeah, yeah. Where, did they have to place you in like a coma or something for a bit yeah. as well? So I mean, yeah. terrible. You know, that's uh, that's hardcore stuff. <laughs> yeah, it was, you would it was... you would think, I would think, twice. About going back and doing it again, and and yeah. and and the kind of thing that would nag in your mind when you did that, and then obviously now you've gone on and you've achieved this gold medal, so I think that just adds to the achievement that this is this you know everything that you've had going on, on many levels in your life away from the track, and still to achieve all you've achieved, is it incredible really? Yeah, no, thank you very much. I mean, it was that was one of the toughest moments in my life um, to kind of. I mean, to start off with, we obviously ended up like breaking the leg, which was which was a problem. But you know, we were still smiling. We're like, yeah, look, it's broken leg. It's bad. It's a long one to time off. But I'm safe. I'm okay. Um, they had to operate on it, so we were in the we were in hospital for a day, and then slowly sort of started to happen. That like my breathing, it was like the bones from the uh, from like the break, the fragments coming coming to my bloodstream, and it going into my lungs. So that was really horrible. Um, and then out of nowhere, you know, I was in this real life threatening kind of condition and it was like it was out of nowhere you know so for me it was it was really tough um but I just remember just like talking to Kristen and my mum and that got me through that certain period um for sure and obviously my brother but like we got through that together um it was really tough but I wasn't really thinking a whole lot then you know I kind of got out of hospital and it was like let's go look at the state of my bike <laughs> <laughs> I had a look at my bike and it was like I can't really need, we need to fix that and then within what three weeks of being home the bike's ready to go again and i was like oh it was really cool and then obviously had the whole year watching on the side and as much as that was hard it was also quite good you know because we had the time i had time to grow i had time to kind of learn who i was as a person and kind of understand that obviously to spend a lot of time with Kristen too i mean that was something that doesn't normally because normally we're racing every week and you know obviously we were fairly new to each other then so for us for me it was one of those things that was really tough but it also taught, taught me a lot about myself and I was obviously really glad that I could spend that certain period of time with Kristen and understand each other, and that, that's that's where we're at now. Um, and yeah, I mean, we then got the call from Ian Sinderson um, from ATPI to, uh, oh, do you want to come to Australia? And this was, I was literally been on a bike, like one of my first practice, um, I've been November, roughly, or maybe just before uh, in 2019. And he was like, oh, do you want to go to Australia and race? And I'm like, uh, yeah, of like, course I do. Yeah, well, I want to go race. And, I never raced anyone and went there and that was really tough. That was one of the biggest struggles I've had racing. Um, in my opinion, uh, it wasn't, wasn't physically, my leg was absolutely spot on. It wasn't, and it wasn't like I was out of shape. I mean, it was just more my, my, my mindset, you know, it was, I was, I was pretty frightened. I was pretty scared. Um, in all honesty, I mean, it is, it, it's hard to say because you, you don't want to let people know your weaknesses, but I've built a lot from then now and that's now in, in, in the past. So for me, it's no problem to talk about, but, you know, like like chasing people, I would kind of follow. Um, I wasn't racing. I was the last to drop the clutch because I didn't want to be in the first corner. You know, all those sort of things. I didn't want to be close to people. And I was going in the corner behind someone and I was thinking, oh, I could hurt myself here again, you know. And that was really tough. That was a really hard point. Um, and then we had 2020, which was, again, that was almost a whole of 2019 out. I had a few practice. And then we then went to, uh, we then just got chucked into the European Under-21 semi-final. And that was like, whoa, okay. That was probably one of the biggest meetings in my career so far. And I hadn't ridden or raced at all, really. So we went there and it ended up qualifying, doing really well. And from that point onwards, we just started to forget about all the bad things. And it was it was to continue on what we can do and to accept that, yeah, things can happen that you don't want in your life. But 
we can also overcome them, you know, and I was back to doing what I love and that was a big point for me. So for me, it was really tough, but it was also even better to learn from that and that was a massive life experience. So we've learned a lot from that, we've gained a lot from that and now we're just looking forward to how we can go even faster. So it's great. I put up a little post out asking for some questions and we got a few. And one of the, one of the questions was from a guy called Chris who says, um, what difference did it have in having access to a sports psychologist uh, in your racing as part of the, like the GB setup, I know that they've, you know, you've got various support and and things like that. Is is that uh, an area of the sport that that requires development? And and how has that sort of mental side of of racing and and of sport, um, you know, affected your performance? In, you know, in in a positive way. Well, if you, if, I mean, you have to look at other sports. So if you have a look at rugby um, or football, back in the day, if you hadn't of if you were the one looking at getting like a like a, like a mental coach, you'd be looked at funny. You know, you'd be looked at, are you okay? You know, do you need a hand? Like, is everything all right? And then now, if you know, if 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 you're the guy that's not having that, you looked at a bit funny. You know, so it's completely changed. Like, same as the fitness. You know, people were to smoke back in the day. Now it's different. Um, whether that's just the time, the era we're in. Whether that's just the people we're surrounded by that are. They're making us believe that's what we've got to do but either way that's that's what everyone's doing so you know it's one of those it's it's tough um I was kind of those one of those people that was like you know I didn't didn't really need that you know what would I need that guy for I mean I'm, I'm strong myself you know blah, blah 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 and I was very naive to it um until I kind of saw the benefits from it and until I started believing in myself um from when I started believing in myself the racing got better and I was like well if someone can help me achieve these goals by just telling me some things that sound so stupid, but it's things that you sort of want to hear, you know, and it's things that, that they can work with you to, to improve you better. And yeah, um, that obviously helped, that helped a lot. I, I haven't admittedly, I haven't done a lot of it, nowhere near the amount that I should have, um, whether that's just the type of person I am, um, or whether that's just where I am in my life at the minute, but for sure, um, if you're, if you need, if you need that, they're always there and they're always there to help. And I know a lot of guys in the, uh, in the speedway, world are doing that now and especially in the in the uh, team gb lot um they're obviously doing that a lot too so for me it's trying to find when the time's right and learn from what i need to learn um but they're always there if i need them and i always know that so i'm very grateful for that yeah fantastic and um i think there was another question which we might have already covered um oh it's from gordon uh, gordon asks what's your main goal this season uh, you know, heading into 2022 i mean we've talked about some of the hopes with the team but for you personally what's What's the, what's the aim as, as we head into this new season? I mean, aim's always really hard. I mean, I never really kind of set myself set in stones. I mean, I kind of, I never really say, oh, I want to be, you know, number one or I want to be this average or I want to do this, but I want to be world 21 champion, you know, things like that. That's that's really hard, you know, and it's kind of more the fact of, I want to just know that I'm keeping proving and I'm keep pushing myself. I really don't, I really don't want to be stuck in the same rut. I've, as long as I know that I'm improving myself in, in a different respect every single year I know that at some point I, I will be improving um improvements obviously really hard to judge you know how can you you know you might end up getting a higher average but there might be a lot of things that went right for you that year and that's kind of hard to judge if you've improved or not I mean I could kind of look at the first meeting at Bellevue where I scored three points and it was on TV and I didn't didn't score many points but for me, that was a massive improvement. You know, for everyone looking on TV, they go, oh, it was only like only not three points. You know, what, what happened there? It was a bad night. But for me, that was, I was, I was happy after that. You know, that was one of those things. It was like a big stone for me. It was like, I did my first premiership meeting. I've got three points and I raced as hard as I could. So that was like a massive point for me. So for me to say, I want to be this, want to be this, want to be this. All it does is put pressure on myself, um, which is unnecessary. You know, I've, I've, got, I've got a lot of people that help me to kind of, where I want to be and that's definitely kind of there's obviously points in your head you want to do of course you want to be an under 21 world championship of course I want to be world champion but at the same time you've got to be realistic you know and that's something that I learned um through like many people last year that kind of like it like explained that to me you know you have to be very realistic and that's what we're doing now so for me we're just trying to work on what we have right in front of us and take each each, each kind of meeting as it comes um and just as long as I know I'm improving myself every way that I can, um, that's 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 enough for me. Well, the Under-21 so. series, of course, different this year. And, and if you did get involved in that, that would be a, a trip to Cardiff, wouldn't it, on the on the Sunday this time yeah. round, which has got to be awesome for, for those involved in that. Yeah, oh, my God, that's unbelievable. I mean, to have that, I mean, I, to see the whole takeover of, of like, Spiro Grand Prix, to have, like, the kind of the same 
stats as Moto GP, where they have the Moto Two, Moto Three, obviously Moto GP. That's that's really great because that shows someone's trying to make a difference there. You know, they they obviously aren't happy with the way it was running, so they're going to change that. And you know, it's fair play to them. You know, they're obviously going to take a huge risk with this. But at the same time, I feel like people will like it. You know, obviously, same as that like Cardiff's the main one that stands out. Of course, it is. But you're also going to two other Grand Prix rounds that you potentially would never ride at again. So it's really important to give people like like the under 21 guys this experience and to understand this is how it works. This is how these guys kind of roll and this is how these tracks are prepared for a meeting of that stature. So for me, it's uh, it's an unbelievable, it would be an unbelievable experience if I can qualify into that, which I hope I will. Um, but again, everything happens for a reason and I really would love to be there um, in front of that kind of crowd, especially, especially going there for my life. So, you know, that would obviously be great. Tom Brennan, my guest on Humans of Speedway. British rising star, already a world champion with the Great Britain Speedway team at the Speedway of Nations, the reigning British under-21 champion. But the question you're asking is, what would his dream Speedway meeting look like? Well, that's the next question coming up in the next part of Humans of Speedway. You're listening to Humans of Speedway. I'm Ian Brannan. My guest this time then is Tom Brennan, world champion with the Great Britain Speedway team at the Speedway of Nations and uh, the British Under-21 champion and a member of the Bellevue Aces in the British Speedway Premiership and the Glasgow Tigers in the Championship. But the million-dollar question is, what would Tom's own dream Speedway meeting look like? And um, these are the same questions that we ask all our guests. So you can go back to the previous episodes and, and get the answers from the previous guests that we've had. Um, but right now, it's over to you, Tom. The first question is, if you were choosing a track to race on purely for the racing, um, for you, what would be the best track, the track that you would choose as your dream track in your dream meeting? Purely for the racing. Yeah, uh, just for the racing. I always remember Torren being a really good track for racing. Like when he used to watch Darcy Ward and obviously Chris Holder and that was always a really cool all the Grand Prix used to be really good there. So I'd probably say Torren for racing, I'd say. Yeah. Definitely. And well, it doesn't have a bad stadium around it either, does it, Torren? But that'd be the next uh, question. That if you're gonna put the Torren track in a stadium, which which stadium would you go for? There's only one really, isn't there? There's only one that's got to be Cardiff, isn't it? Yeah. That, that would be one of those things that would be, yeah, it wouldn't be real. I know people go on about Warsaw, but Warsaw's sort of more spread out, isn't it? Cardiff, it's kind of on top of you much more than Yeah, yeah, than exactly. Yeah, Warsaw, I mean, that looks great. I mean, I've never been, but in the photos, it looks like it's somewhat similar to Cardiff, but you never be able to kind of replicate Cardiff and how it makes everyone feel, I, I don't think. And obviously with the with the riders, with their kind of entries and how they're announced and all the noise is, is is unbelievable and for like that would be yeah that's um definitely couldn't choose anywhere else other than cardiff really yeah i mean a lot of riders who have who have done it who have who've been part of that whole thing you know say that it just completely dominates you you know that that the, the atmosphere the crowd you know it's a it's a whole new thing to to contend with on top of racing against the best riders in the world <laughs> if, if you didn't have enough on your plate already you know the the atmosphere the fact that I think Jordan Palin said he'd spoken to a rider, I don't know who, that was on the start line revving their bike and they couldn't hear their bike revving. Yeah, just, I'm not surprised. You know, not just crazy surprised. set of circumstances. Guys, then you hear some guys that are like, um, that they don't hear anyone, you know, because of that focus. You don't hear, I mean, I don't need, I very rarely can, you can hear other people's bikes, but you just tune everything out, you know. So the start line, wherever you are, it's like, on oh, my own guy, you know. So, so it's hard to actually hear your engine, but at the same time, you sort of just, you know, it's just tough in it, but I imagine at Cardiff that would be uh, that would be pretty spectacular to not be able to hear your bike. Yeah, if we're going to pick a one to seven, then an all-time team for you, who'd be in it? Oh, so number one would be Chris Holder for sure. Ah, definitely. And now, who uh, who beat Chris Holder in the Grand Prix qualifier at Glasgow? I think I think that was myself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That was a terrific race, though, and that, talk about living your dream. Yeah, that was really funny because, I mean, I don't want to go into 
being a fan too much, but I'm definitely a fan. Um, and I kind of was on the phone before to um, my friend um, um, Jamie Jamie Bursil, right? And he was he obviously used to race BYU as well back in, back in the day. But he was uh, we were talking on the way to the meet. He's like, "Oh, you're in the Grand Prix qualifier as as like a reserve." And he's like, "Oh, I can imagine if you get a race with Chris Holder." And I'm like, "Oh, don't be silly! Like I really wish I would." And then after the race, he called me and he's like, "Because he's a big fan of him too." And it was like we grew up like together and watching him and stuff. So it was like you beat Chris Holder and I didn't even, you know, it was like one of those things that was amazing. So, no, it was really fun. Um, at the same time, I mean, I know it's only a race, but that will, that will be one of the greatest memories I think I have as well. Um, but, yeah. And then I think number five would probably be Ward, definitely. Ah, the Turbo Twins in your team then? Yeah, you got to be. I mean, that's always, that's a big standout for me growing up, for sure. I mean, seeing those two at Paul was like, whoa, that's amazing, really. So, yeah. Got- like a fan now, I don't know. You need to, I need to get a supporters hat, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so then, uh, Holder and Ward, the first two on the team sheet. Who's next? I always liked um, Emil Safutinov, number three, definitely. I'm surprised he hasn't actually done it, you know, yeah. yet. Be world champion. He's been so close for so long, hasn't he? Yeah, he seems like, yeah, it's just, it should have happened, really. But um, yeah, and then I say Woofy. Definitely. Woofy. Okay, cool. Yeah, for sure. Uh, well, being in the team with him, of course, you, you've you've obviously got to know him pretty well by now, I imagine, yeah? Yeah, I mean, he was he's like such a cool character. I mean, you don't really kind of notice it too much until you kind of see him a little bit. But the way he is like in front of like the cameras and the way he is like with his mechanics and the way he works and it's just really cool. Like it was like really, it was, re- it was really cool to see how he works, you know. So that was, that was, that was really cool. Um, I'm trying to think who else now. Uh, smiles a little But we've got two big of a team here. I think I need to choose the reserves as more realistic reserves. But, yeah. <laughs> you don't have to worry. There's there's, there's no limits. So um, Bartosz Smarschlik in the side, uh, which takes it to Holder, Wuffenden, Saifutinov, Smarschlik, Ward. Um, and then you've got you've got two leftover spots for your reserves. So who are you going to have? Nicky Pedersen. Ah, oh, you see, we like a good pantomime villain, but the reception he always used to get at Cardiff was just, you know, it it was intense. Like, but it you could tell it fired him up as well, couldn't you? You know, he loved it. He loved everyone calling him the names and chatting it and booing him and stuff. That's that's what got him going for sure. And he was like, yeah, I mean, the Grand Prix as good as the Grand Prix are now, it still isn't quite the same without someone that you don't like in there, like or that everyone doesn't seem to like. It's real funny, but um, no, uh, it's one of those, isn't it? But, no, uh, so you got you got one more slot left. Um, you know, you, you you could put yourself in if you wanted. Put myself in, but that would be that would be um, a bit of a clash there, really, wouldn't it? World class riders, but I reckon I'll go. I reckon we go, Dan. We'll put, put Dan back at reserve. Dan Bewley. Sure, I think that's that. that would be a pretty cool team. That's not bad. Holder, Wuffenden, Saifudinov, Schmarschlik, Ward, Pedersen, and Bewley. <laughs> that would sell the tickets, wouldn't it? Do that one, and I'll be the team manager. Ah, you're the team manager. Cool. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So the next question would be: um, Do you have a particular referee that uh, that you, that you, you you'd choose to referee this? Because I think referees often get forgotten about in in, in speedway yeah. meetings, and, and sometimes you'd say, "Well, if you're not talking about referee, they're doing they're doing the job well." But um, who who'd referee it for you? I'm gonna be completely honest and people are probably not going to like the answer to this because I actually have no idea I don't know any of the referees I have no I do not know who's referee in a meeting I who's the one who does the Grand Prix from England uh, Craig Ackroyd that's him that's yeah. the only referee I know, like as in standout name so we'll go Craig Ackroyd Craig Ackroyd is always a good shout um, good. if you're going to change one rule of Speedway for this new for this new season what what would you change straight away no, I've thought this for a while. I think get rid of helmet colours. Mm, so okay. people have their own crash helmet design and it'll be like more personal, you know, they could have whatever they want on there. And then maybe we could change, like have race jackets that are, I don't know, keep maybe keep the yellow, white, blue and red, but maybe race jackets or maybe we could have like a fork cover or I don't know, something a bit different because I feel like the helmet colours, like if you look at motocross or F1 or MotoGP, their helmet design is their like main point of reference, you know, like their number and their helmet. You wouldn't have a clue who else it was otherwise, would you? You know, so 
for me that would be a really cool moment you know if we could have get rid of the helmet colors and get on with the with the cool designs well that is a first nobody's ever said that before i like it no. uh, different yeah um, I- share it around and see who else wants it yeah let's let's float that idea i'll i'll, I'll pass it on we'll tell everybody yeah uh that's yeah. A, that's a good one and um the opposition then for your team because you've got this this team of world beaters now the opposition would be a, an actual team that existed at some point any point in time a, a real team one of the great teams so who would you race against one of the greatest teams um Oh, oh yes, Cradley. That's what I got. Everyone, everyone I talked to, and I mean, no matter where, Cradley was the best place in the world, and no one ever come near that. That's all I get told. And it, and it, and it, Dudley was one of the like, it was probably one of the worst looking stadiums, and it wasn't like nothing was new, but it was like real special to everyone. And that was, I actually, yeah, I thought that before. I was like, I wonder what it would be like to race there. But their team was pretty unstoppable too. So yeah, we gotta go with Cradley. I'm not sure what, what year. Cradley eighty three, I think, was the was the team. There you go, then that one. Yeah, you go with yeah, that. Yeah, so that was like Eric Eric Gunderson and all those sort of guys. I've heard a lot of stories about Dudley Wood and oh my god, everyone. I mean, when I was working not so long ago, and um, people come in and they'd be like, "Oh, you, you know, you ever heard Dudley Wood?" And I'm like, "How does everyone know about Dudley Wood?" I've never heard. You know, obviously I'm too young, but they were. You know, they always rave about it. So that's quite cool. Yeah. Are you in the Midlands then, or is that where whereabouts you're based? So I was yeah. wondering how many, so, you know, if you're like further down south, it's unusual. So many people talk about Dudley Wood. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I was going to say that's a bit strange, but uh, no, I was obviously always. So I was, I was born in Swindon, lived in Brighton from the age of about nine or ten till about about seventeen, and then now I'm here, obviously with uh, with uh, Kristen in um, Wolverhampton. In the, oh right, okay. Yeah, Midlands. So I'm here now. Yeah. Omarum. Omarum. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm still picking up the accent every time I do. I, I make sure I give myself a shake and get rid of it. So. <laughs> yeah, it's all good. I once went, I went to Wolverhampton. I was working in Birmingham quite a bit a few years ago. I was working at Smooth Radio in Birmingham and uh, I got on the tram from Birmingham to Wolverhampton to go yeah. to uh, Monmore one Monday night. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that was a good experience. Yeah. Um, it's sort of weird being on a tram full of Speedway supporters and it was all rammed. It was kind yeah. of like, wow, this is no, like what, this what, like for, for other sporting me. events where they've what, got to um, what, cram uh, public what transport. What you're doing at the minute is absolutely fantastic. So thank you. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, sure. thanks very much for speaking to us, Tom. It's been it's been great and um, all, always a pleasure. And um, I hope that you, you, your season goes goes as, as, as we all hope because I think it is going to be a big year. It's going to be an exciting year for for British Speedway, I think, and for everybody else. No, definitely. And thank you very much for having me. And obviously, what, um, what, are, what are you're doing at the minute is absolutely fantastic. So thank you. Just keep, keep at it, for sure. Always a pleasure, Tom, and uh, all the best for the season ahead. Uh, Tom Brennan, my guest on Humans of Speedway. And um, Tom is part of a little mini-series, really, that's, uh, that we've done. The, the last few episodes have been dedicated to the rising stars, the future of British Speedway. So don't forget to check out the previous episodes if you haven't heard them yet with Jordan Palin and Jordan Jenkins, um, two of British Speedway's rising stars and part of that GB Academy setup that uh, you might have seen being put through their pace recently at the time of recording this Uh, plenty more episodes besides that as well we've um, spoken with Tom Brennan the British under 21 champion we've also spoken with the uh, British senior champion and that's uh, Adam Ellis um, a few episodes ago we've also recently caught up with Chris Louie uh, with David Howe and um, previous episodes even going back um, further in time with the likes of Nikolai Clint Paco Castagna Chris Morton for the Bellevue fans. Don't forget to check him out. Uh, We spoke to Gary Havelock, Jeremy Doncaster, Kelvin Tatum, uh, many, many more besides as well. Please do have a listen to the back catalogue and join us for the next episode, which will be on the way soon of Humans of Speedway. Take care and we'll catch you soon. Sports Social Podcast Network. Lucky Land Casino, asking people, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? Lucky? In line at the deli, I guess? Aha, in my dentist's office. 
More than once, actually. Do I have to say? Yes, you do. In the car before my kids' PTA meeting. Really? Yes. Excuse me, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? I never win and tell. Well, there you have it. You can get lucky anywhere, playing at LuckyLandSlots.com. Play for free right now. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details.